Well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Zaina. I am a physical therapist and Pilates instructor. I've been doing this for 16 years now, um, or more actually, since 2002, however many years that is. I can't even count anymore. <laughs> and um, I have a um, Kim and I work together, we're in here. She's actually in California and I'm actually in Switzerland at the moment. So we are um, all over the place right now. And I wanted to welcome you to this session, which is something that we kind of dreamed up, especially during this COVID time when everybody was so isolated, just to give us a chance to commune with other people to share ideas, to help each other be better practitioners and to help us all be better at what we're doing and help our clients get better. So that was sort of the impetus for this. And we started out with a small group of people just within our studio, and then we started branching outward. And so now I think the group has over 300 members and people just pop in and out and we're always getting new people in, which we absolutely love. So thank you for being here. Um, and usually we talk about either a case study or a theme or answer questions. So if you guys have themes and questions that you wanted to bring up, we can talk about them as a group. Um, what questions, I can tell you the two questions that I've had this week that came up since last, um, I mentioned, I think last at the end of last session, one was about queuing and how do you queue, especially um, through queuing small muscle action, especially through uh, hands off in a hands off type of session. So what kind of cues could you use, for example, to cue glute medius to turn on, to cue feet to, to lift up, arches to lift up, um, to activate the smaller muscle, to cue VMO on. So what kinds of cues and tools can we use for that? And the other question that I've had was we were discussing shoulders and the fact that the dominant shoulder side hand typically has a greater slant to it than the non-dominant side. And the question came up as to why is that and what do we do about that? Or do we do about that? anything or leave it as is. So um, so those were the two questions that came up that I thought we could address today. And um, does that sound okay for you guys? Yeah? <laughs> okay. And feel free to input. If you have input on the ideas, I'll, I'll get us started. I'll tell you what I know. Um, I think I'll start with the shoulder because I think that's just a little bit more direct and clear. And then we can talk about the queuing and, and figure out which parts we wanted to talk about there. And then, um, yeah, feel free to give some input there. So the reason that shoulder issue came up is because at our clinic now, we're doing a postural evaluation for every intake. Every person that comes in, we've decided we would like to share and have them do a, um, before they do any group classes, also do a postural evaluation and a, and a primary intake. And we were reviewing that postural evaluation and the most important aspects of the postural evaluation. And as we got up through the feet, knees, hips, shoulders came up that noticing that the dominant side is typically a little bit slanted downward. And so my initial thought was, okay, usually the dominant side is the stronger side of the body. Uh, and so typically the lat will be a little bit stronger on that side. If the lat creates more strength or more pull, Right, it's going to actually lower the shoulder. So if you remember lat and lower trapezius action is this downward shrugging of the shoulder blade. And if we remember where the lat comes from and inserts into, it originates at the thoracolumbar fascia, which attaches to the back of the ilia here and comes up as thoracolumbar fascia through the back body, or sometimes we call it sort of that wing muscle because it comes out here to the side, but then if you remember, it inserts into the anterior shoulder, right? So if we think of big development of that lat, we're getting a little bit of a downward pulling on that side. So that downward pulling over time 
can start to create a little bit of a downward angle to the dominant side of the shoulder. So I was looking in the research just to back that up. There is some back, there is a lot of backup for that, for the dominant side musculature being tighter and stronger and that that's creating that downward sloping. The other interesting piece that came up with that is um, the, the comment came up that the shoulder tends also to be a little rotated anterior or more rounded on that dominant side. And again, that sort of follows in with the musculature on that side being stronger, including the musculature of the pec and the pec minor being stronger. And therefore a lot of times when it's stronger, it's shorter. So that shortening of the pec minor tends to pull the head of the humerus slightly forward as well. So we, we may get that downward pull and we may also get more of a forward rotation or anterior rota medial rotation of the humerus with that pec pulling tight to the anterior shoulder. And, and as you remember again, one more time back to the lat, that's a medially insert, medial insertion into the anterior humerus. So that lat tightness, if there was lat tightness, would also pull the shoulder into a slight rotation, anterior rotation, or medial rotation, I should say. We, it looks anterior, but it's like a medial rotation there. So uh, those were the two ideas. My question and the answer that I didn't find uh, specifically was, if the dominant side is stronger, how come the upper trap, which I've come to, to call one of the dummy muscles of the body because it always does too much work. So I, I call it a big dummy and sometimes wish that people didn't even have an upper trapezius <laughs> because it's often pulling up. So it's interesting that when you are more dominant on that side, it's not the upper trapezius that's overdeveloped and pulling up, it's actually the lat that pulls it down. So I don't know why that is. Um, I didn't find any research on the upper trapezius versus lat. Uh, maybe I didn't look deeply enough, but I didn't find that. What I did find is that people who are more likely to have the slanting down on that dominant side are uh, one-sided athletes or overhead throwing athletes. So in the US, it'd be like baseball, football, uh, American football, also, golf and tennis, one-handed sport, sport people tend to have more of that dominant side slope. Uh, and then if you look at all the kind of common, I would say the, if you did a Google search, for example, and you look for uh, uneven shoulders, you're going to see all kinds of websites that are saying, if you don't like the appearance of your uneven shoulders, here are three exercises you can do to change that look, right? And I agree there are exercises you can definitely do, but I think it's going to have to be a lifestyle change in order for that to maintain because you really have to redevelop musculature in a different way. So if, if you think about tissue time to heal and tissue time, muscle time to grow, it's at least a commitment for like six to eight weeks of consistently exercising in a way that strengthens equally and stretches open, which is something we can all teach and something we can all do. But then if that person is, a con is constantly in a sport, like a constantly in a sport where they're using that dominant side only more than the other, the work that you're doing in the exercises for an hour or two a week is probably not enough to counter the work that the strengthening work and the work they're doing as a one-sided athlete. So um, what we don't want to see is dysfunction that leads down into the torso that creates an imbalance and a side bend or some other change. We really don't want to see that. So I think, I think it's super important for these athletes to train as evenly as they can. And most of them, if they're at a high level, are doing work. It would be great if they were all doing Pilates. Some are doing Pilates. Some are doing um, more weight, weight training, but doing that in an even way. And my dream is that golfers would at least go to the driving range and hit the golf balls on the opposite side. Like that would be my dream. Every, that every golfer has to golf at least at the driving range on both sides, because I think we could prevent a lot of injuries if they were doing that, um, those sports on two sides and tennis at least has a backhand, but golf and golf has the back swing and the floor swing, 
but still it's it's they become so uneven over time that it would be nice if we could even those athletes out so <laughs> so that is what i know about shoulder sloping i don't know if you guys have any questions or anything to add on that specifically no is it something you see commonly when you're looking at posture or how often do you, is it something that comes up for you guys? I don't think it's terrible. Often it's, it's so minor that it's almost worth not messing with it. And with mm -hmm. some people, I think it's not, you know, that they're, they're not athletes, but they've always carried their handbag on one side so a lot of it is to do with with that action of just holding it in place um and then i just you know make sure that that they're mobilizing all the different arm movements retraction retraction and or everything just to kind of keep it all mobile and you know lifting and dropping the shoulders just so that but you know if they don't have if it's not causing them a problem I don't really want to go, unless it's something really dramatic, I wouldn't want to go in there and do anything more drastic because you could end up causing more of a problem. I agree. And actually, thank you for saying, bringing that up about the handbag because that is something else that does show up in the research yeah. is that constantly carrying a handbag on the same side can start to cause a difference uh, side to side as well. So um, I agree. I think, and I'm with you on the, if it's not broken, there isn't, and it's minor, there's not a lot of fixing to be done. I think if you see a big difference, then especially in a young person, if you were to see a really big difference, I think that's an alarm bell maybe should be yeah. going off there. But I think if it's somebody um, who has pretty even Ness, very close and is not having any symptoms and you're working on both sides evenly I think you're right you're pretty much on track there yeah I would totally agree great so um any other thoughts on that topic specifically I, I I'm a quite a young teacher I used to be a marketing director and changed uh, about six years ago but today I'm a yoga teacher, I'm a Pilates teacher and I'm also a Garuda teacher and if someone, uh, I'm agree with, I, yeah, the first name. I, I don't have either some very big problems of shoulders, uh, unlevel shoulder with my clients but if I feel the very tense I tend to work a lot on Garuda technique and uh, uh, yoga technique, which I find myself uh, opening much more the upper body and the chest and level, because uh, Garuda, it's all about uh, opening its, uh, your, your back ribs and uh, leave space. And then suddenly you create some space and uh, shoulder naturally uh, take their space uh, if it's making sense but I don't have very strong case to handle so I'm not uh, I'm, I'm much more seeing people who are overstressed and closing themselves and then it's all the shoulders and uh, uh, so you need to open their chest and they need to breathe and really get their neck uh, long uh, rather than one which is uh, unbalanced so uh, i can't really address your your request if it's mm -hmm. head and neck are going to be involved as well with anything where the shoulders tight or whatever it, it, it's going to there could be some head, head and neck involvement so you know i'd be putting them on the roll to open everything out you know using weights so that again, it kind of stretches, just lots of opening out neck mobility, shoulder mobility, and um, hopefully <laughs> resolve. <laughs> yes, yes, I agree. And thank you uh, for talking about the, the breath work and the rib cage and the opening. If we think about 
I lately, um, actually I was working, Genevieve just joined a little bit late, but we've been working today together for most of the morning, um, most of the day. And a lot of our clients are really stuck in this rib cage uh, and stuck, even if you think about it, stuck rib cage is a stuck scapular positioning too, right? So if the rib cage can't expand, the scapula probably can't move properly either that's going to contribute to all of this closing and the tension uh, that you were talking about that coming up motion happens. And those first ribs go upward in elevation as well when you get stuck in this. So the whole thing gets, uh, can get really congested and stuck. So opening up, breathing the, into the back ribs, getting on the roller is one of my favorite is to have people opening out on the roller to open the front um, to, to mobilize that thoracic spine and then create more scapular movement is also, a, I think, a really great tool. So thank you for bringing up the breathing as well. I think that's a great, great thing to incorporate here um, in this situation too. And I agree, if it, it's only if it's a really severe case. Um, I think even those techniques you were talking about work in a severe case. So uh, especially with the breath and then the alignment and the opening and the rib cage. That's excellent. I think I would totally agree that that would work even for a more severe case. Yeah. All right. Well, um, shall I move on to queuing a little bit? Uh, I think that we've all, uh, I was talking to one of my clients today, actually, uh, I, I get excited by um, seeing progress, of course, I think we all do. That's why we're all in this, right, is seeing progress. And this is a client that I've been working with. I had a chance to work with in person. And then she actually moved away from me. She moved to Florida. And then um, she fell off into her world of having to be on the computer and having to be on Zoom. Uh, she has a hip osteoarthritis issue, but she's also super hypermobile. So I think on the that hypermobility spectrum um, has a really hard time. And I don't know if you've seen this a lot. Um, I've seen it a lot with people who have osteoarthritis and hip, pretty severe osteoarthritis, that they can no longer activate muscles around that hip joint, right? And I think that's true for a lot of joints that have that osteoarthritis. And so I was just chatting with her this morning because we've been having to go through this whole activation pattern of exercises just to get her to be able to do footwork on the reformer without with good form and with even with muscles firing without just quad pressure right to get a good footwork we've been going through these little patterns and we were talking about how over zoom it's so much more about the cueing the verbal cueing than it's ever been before and she said i think you've become such a better teacher over these last this last year, because you can really get me to do this just with words now without even having to touch me, which is really encouraging from hearing from her. But I also get excited about these little ways of how I can get somebody to feel something with, with words. And so maybe I could take you through a little bit of different things on a few exercises that I use with her. And then if you guys have some things to, ch to um, add to that, I'd love to hear. So if it, one of the things, uh, I'm gonna just move for a second so you can see what I'm doing. So I've been using a lot with her, the um, famous squishy ball, right? And I've also been using a lot with her leg elevation because I think that that helps engage into the deep abdominals. Um, and the other thing that I didn't mention in her case the hypermobility issue in her case is severe enough that she has uh, issues with continence and incontinence. She's young too. So it's, and she's never had kids. So it really doesn't have to do with birthing or any or age related. It's very hypermobility related. So that just gives you an idea how mobile she is. So one of my big things with her is also engaging pelvic floor, but she's had dysfunction. So engaging pelvic floor too much will get her stuck so that she can't release anymore too. So I don't actually cue the pelvic floor. I just cheat. I call it cheating, right? I can get what I want without having them have to go to the brain to get it. So that's, that's sort of my goal with her is to get her body to do it without her brain having to be involved. So one of my favorites with her and the way we start almost every session is with her legs elevated either 
on like a roller or a little bit higher onto a box. Like you take the long box of the reformer and I have her put the ball actually a little low, not quite as high, kind of around the knees. And then we go into um, a little bit of a squeeze here just to start uh, cueing. So I'm just telling her to breathe, to land, breathe, and then activate inner thighs towards each other. Remembering that inner thigh activation also activates pelvic floor, right? So I'm cheating, I'm cheating by getting her to squeeze without her thinking about it and then asking her to just let her belly drop in and kind of just feel that action going up into her body and then releasing. So by keeping that contraction at a sub-maximal level, Right? I'm not recruiting huge, big inner thigh. I'm just recruiting probably my, my pelvic floor a little bit more, I'm probably getting my gracilis and some of those longer mu muscles working into here just to give me a little activation in that pelvic floor and, and the inner thighs. And then I can add a little coccyx curl with some length. And I always, with her especially, cue that lengthening here to get the muscles on the deep abs on to get her glutes to start firing. So my goal with her is to find glute medius. That's the one she always complains. She can't get her glutes to fire. So we just start with activation in her thigh, pelvic floor, and that always helps get glute medius on. And then with her, she's one of the ones that can actually still externally rotate with, um, even though she has the hip osteoarthritis, so here I can have her a lot of times use the turn out because she can actually get wrapped into piriformis. So her hip rotators do an okay job. So I will take her in this position, exhaling, belly dropping and just squeezing heels into a little external rotation just to fire, right? But not so much that she's curling and lifting and then releasing. And we'll do that a few times and then from there, I can have her go into that external rotation and then I'll have her cheat her feet back parallel, but keeping that activation. And then that really helps her find this footwork activation in parallel. And then from here, we can actually, this is, I know this is not footwork, but we can actually have her moving in through footwork, keeping that activation on. So we'll use that a lot of times to get this on in this position. And then from there, you guys tell me if you want me to pause, if you want to add anything, jump right in. But from there, I usually take her prone and still using the little ball and take in that between the feet there. So I'll take her here and I'll actually have started really cueing the opening of the front of the pelvis, right? So almost a relaxation. So I let the ball hit the floor and the feet hit the floor with it. And I tell her to take a breath in and then exhale and let the front of the pelvis start to open, right? So there's length with that. I can lengthen through, I can open this and also some length in her tail. And I often have her put her own hands back here. And then instead of lifting the legs, I tell her to let her feet stay on the floor and pick up her kneecaps and find length through the backs of her legs. And so if you try that, it really helps get the quads on. So I'm activating, uh, it's a light activation of the quad, right? So submaximal contraction. So I'm getting my little areas of those muscles on like the vastus medialis, the oblique part. I'm getting the length through my tail and I'm getting activation uh, all the way down the legs and length through the legs and hips and then just because I'm in this position, I have no choice but to get my glutes involved and my hamstrings, right? So, and then if, if they could, I can find length through the whole body. I can rest the head or stretch it. And then I can have a tiny bit of a lift here. But I tell them that lifting is not the goal. The length is the goal. The lengthening really helps open up. And then because again, I have that little ball there, I've created that connection back up the inner thighs all the way up through the pelvic floor and out, uh, hopefully, eventually out through the whole head if I can get that working for them. So in into in that initial 
session, our initial session starts with at least those two things. And then we move upward from there. Um, so just throw it out, you see if you guys have any, anything to add to that. Before well, I, I mean, talking. obviously, you, you have you said she's so hypermobile that obviously in that prone position, pulling up the drawing up the quads, she's in danger of of over straightening the knee joint. Of, of, you know, so it's got to be cued so carefully. And I think, um, you know, I would be if I couldn't touch, I would be getting the client to touch themselves. But you also said that she was putting her hands here on her pelvis and things like that. You know that that touching is a great cue. Um, other things that you can do is, if you use that soft ball, just under the elbow. So again, so they can't overstretch the elbow under the back of the knee when they're lying on their backs. Then they can do a very slow, slow, slight pressure down, and that you know mm. will make activate the small muscles because mm -hmm. as soon as they go to do a, a, a larger movement or a quicker movement that the, the other muscles are going to take over so I do find that the, having the ball under the elbows pressing down the arms pressing down the legs mm -hmm. those ones are, are really quite useful but you know with the hypermobility if you want them to to know where to stop to then work the muscles around the joint in neutral They've, they've got to have a mirror. But then of course with Zoom, it's working really well because they can see themselves. They can see you and they can see themselves. So, you know, you've got your ball between the knees and, and between the thighs, actually, if you squeeze between the thighs, yeah. they're less yeah. likely to over stretch at the back of the knee. And they can see in the mirror as they're bent or in the screen as they're bending and stretching ball between the knees, then ball between the ankles, you know, and they can turn sideways on. So in that way, actually online is, is quite a lot better, particularly if you're working somewhere without a mirror, you know, mm -hmm. it's quite good for them to be able to do that. And then they can practice that once they've got what it looks like and what it feels like. And then they can go back and try again and, and practice it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, some people are not body aware. So you could literally oh, have them tough. in in your hands physically every day and the next day they'd be out of alignment and they wouldn't remember <laughs> anyway. So it all depends who you're working with. Yeah, I, I'll add to that. I, I love this one. I love the idea of the ball behind um, to stop that mobility. I'll show you if you guys want one that I use in standing with her in particular. Mm -hmm. Um, because of that, my, my thought, um, when they're like in this position, I find that if it's unloaded, I feel a lot safer with um, not worrying as much about hyperextending. Um, because even if, if the back of the feet stay down and I lift up, it's really hard for me. I, they can I, only I, go I, so far. Yeah. Exactly. They can only go so far. So this, I feel like is a pretty safe place if you are worried um, without hands. And, and I totally agree with you. It's great that they can see, but it's also great to think about places where I try and always think about places where I can get them to do what I want them to do without without them messing it up <laughs> without really explaining as much of what my goal is but just trying to get them and and the other cue that helps I think is the lengthening that's why I stopped thinking of lifting because when when I ask them to lift I they end up in that spine right in the lower spine and there's not a lot I can do to help them out of that but if I just tell them lengthen then we don't I don't seem to have that problem so much at least if the complaints don't come back as so maybe something to play with and, and tell me what you think about that as well. Uh, you see, you see, you what I find, then I think even people without hypermobility, when they're doing swimming legs, they always struggle, don't they? especially if they are tight in the hip flexors or they're in yeah. these. So very much where you've got them lying in prone. And then what I have them is, is, um, is um, turn the feet under 
so they're on tiptoes yeah so you're lying yeah so you're on tiptoes and then one at a time just have the knees soft bend the knees soft onto the floor and then just lifting extending one knee just off the floor then once they've got that then pointing the foot away to take it away so then they've got the height for the swimming the legs that they're not dropping the pelvis and overlifting um and then two feet whatever and, and and build it from there and I found that's quite a nice way also checking that the glutes are firing in at that point as well that you can really mm-hmm. see how it's working so I don't know yeah. if I found that's been a nice way of working in swimming yeah yes I love that feels great to do that mm-hmm. feels really great it, yeah. it just gives that proprioception we were talking about last week somewhere at the end point. Otherwise, you're lifting your leg up and down. You just don't know where you are in space. You can't feel it anywhere. So mm-hmm. it's a nice little bit of a proprioception feedback mm-hmm. on that one as well. Yeah. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. Any other thoughts on any of those? I, I like that one. Um, this is Kim. Karen, I really like that. That's great because I was trying to have somebody do swimming yet just yesterday and their legs were flying and I was like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. Um, my question was about Wendy. You said something about putting the ball under the elbow. Yeah, what, where? What you, arms long okay. by your side. Okay. <laughs> just under the elbow. Oh. Just, so okay. Palm down. Because palm down, then then you can't mm-hmm. hyperextend the elbow, mm-hmm. elbow slightly bent, and just gently pressing down. And you feel you feel all the muscles around engaging. Yeah, um, muscles in the back. That's where I'm well, kind of feeling it. Muscles around the shoulder joint, muscles around the scapula. Definitely, yeah. 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 And the arm, obviously itself. There's a lot, quite a lot happening. If you do it really slowly, you can just yeah. feel it happening. Well, Genevieve, you hypermobile person, you do it. Uh, it can be, I'm not hypermobile, so. <laughs> yes. She's doing it. Yeah, I, I like that. It's, um, I've, I'm big hypermobile, so. Um, Me too. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but that's nice, and it's because um, that that is one of those things where you know we kind of sit into that joint, and then you don't really have to do anything; <laughs> just kind of sits there. Um, that's a nice reaching feeling uh, without enabling that. So, yeah, I like that. Excellent. Great. Well, let me show you if, unless you guys want to pipe in again, I, feel free at any time. Kim, palm yeah. down. Sorry, not palm Go up, ahead. but palm down. I think you can feel more palm down. But, sorry, I just saw it happening, so I needed to. No, please, please jump right in. Yes, <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, I can totally. Yeah, yeah, I can totally feel more with my palm down. Good, excellent. So the one that I do in standing on the same theme of anti hyperextension is um, getting a band uh, or so the two ways. The way I actually she, this woman that I'm working with that I was mentioning, she has a reformer at home. So she, so we're actually doing it with the reformer. Um, so you can, I'll explain that. I'll show this and then I'll explain how um, it's done on the reformer. I'm going to just try and attach this. So you need to attach the band to something. And so that you can wrap it behind your knee. So it goes right behind the knee. Uh-huh. Yep. So some of you might know this one already, right? We call it terminal knee extension in uh, physical therapy land, but um, you, though it gets harder if you were to just stand on that one leg. That's the hardest version, right? You can also have, in her case, she's keeping the foot down for now. 
And the band is enough pressure that it's pulling my knee into a little bit of a flexion. I don't, I don't want that flexion to affect my whole torso though. So I want to come up and I want to allow the knee into a slight bend. And then my work is that straightening motion into the band and it's slow, but it's slow and painful. <laughs> so slow so that what's happening and maybe you can see it is I'm, my kneecaps lifting that medial quad is activating, but the band that feedback is preventing me from just snapping into my hyperextension, right? So I can really learn to release. And again, I'm keeping that pelvis as square as I can and then pressing back into a full extension without the hyper part of it, right? So here, and then it gives enough feedback that I know where to stop and I don't, and I feel like I actually have some power in that stopping place. So on the reformer, the way we do it is I have her stand on the floor next to the reformer and she takes the strap, the pulling strap and puts the loop up behind her knee. And so she's facing the risers of the reformer and she's doing the same exercise here with that. And, and we did it on just one blue spring. So a, a light, a second to lightest spring possible. Just one spring was enough for her to really get this feeling. And then she can pull back as far as she wants. So you don't have to put a lot of weight. You can just have them pull back into however much resistance they want. So this one I find just gives so much um, control. It feels really nice. I end up feeling like really uh, aligned and on in this knee and that I have a lot of control after that without having to, I can stop really well now and I can even stand on it really well without having to you know, do what I would more naturally do, which is block it out and go into that hyper hyper extension land. So that would, I take that as the standing version of what Wendy, you were explaining with the knee over the ball. Um, but just so that we can transition that into more function and loading once they get the idea upward. So that's one of my favorite cues or cheats to get that. No, it's really good. On. I mean, you, you could just see your, your knee, it just came exactly into neutral. Mm -hmm. and it was, yeah. 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 So try that out. If you get a chance, try it either with the, just a band or on the reformer. Um, it, uh, it's one of my favorites, actually. I, and it feels good. You should try it on your own knees. Even if you're not hypermobile, I think it feels really good mm. for the knees. We've done it on our elbows as well, Sina. So we put ah. the band around the elbows. So you have two people. So if you're on all four point kneeling, then you have somebody holding the band around the elbow. And then you're just doing your gradual same thing, bending and stretching, because you know all the hypermobility you want to turn their elbows to face the forwards and not getting them turning into each other. That's it. So doing it the same way, that way as well. Yeah. Oh, I have never done that. I love that. <laughs> Actually, you maybe could I don't have like the band around both elbows. If you haven't got another person, you could have yeah. a band around both Found of your elbows. elbows with oh, the elbows. We, for we forget about the arms and the upper body and you come to do any four point kneeling or plank work or anything and the elbows go straight into hyperextension. And yeah. Okay, so I'll let you in on a little secret. <laughs> I, um, I used to do a lot of Chinese acrobatics. That was my background is aerial, aerial circus work. And for my cross training, I had to work with my Chinese acrobatic coach who used to torture me. And I have one of the coaches said I would have never been selected to be an acrobat in China because my elbows go the wrong way. The wrong way, yeah. And so I said, oh, I'm not training with you. I'm going to train with the other coach. But then he would torture me by having me do this with, mm. and then do handstands with the band around my elbows like this, which was just mean. <laughs> <laughs> but here we are again at your keep trying to keep the lines of the elbows in towards each other. You can see I'm not very good at it. But, um, but yes, thank you. I, I have not used this with my clients, but now thank you because maybe I can torture them back. Get back. You can do it much more gently than your coach. You don't have to. I don't have to make them do handstands. I can just keep them on all fours, right? So, so yeah, this is great. Thank you for bringing that in. Yes, lovely. 
<laughs> All right, what other torture tricks can you give me going forward <laughs> here? <laughs> um, let me think, the other, so if we go up the body then, let's go from, uh, we've kind of hit glute, knees, glutes, hip. We've got a little shoulders and a little elbows. Um, the other thing that I've been really, thank you. Yes, I'm going right to the head. Thank you. So um, it's such a lovely feeling to find length in the back of the neck, I think. Um, I think hopefully you've all experienced that. And most of our clients, I think, in their lives don't even know, don't have a clue where to go with that. And so um, my favorite cue is to have, I, I stopped, I should just give you one of my pet peeves was in physical therapy school, actually, even they talked about lengthening the neck by chin tucking to stretch the back of the neck. So the idea is if you guys remember anatomically, we have those rectus capodi muscles, which are the super short muscles, uh, kind of single or double level, they're oblique, they're direct straight and they're inferior and superior versions of them, but they're the muscles that shorten when we go into forward head posture, which is basically everybody now, thanks to our workstation world, right? So those ones get short and then we get lengthened in the front of the neck here. And so the physical therapy, when I was in school a long time ago, hopefully they've changed now, but was, okay, so you chin tuck, right? So the idea is chin tuck is that you're stretching those muscles in the back. But what happens when you ask somebody to chin tuck is they end up double, triple chinning right, themselves. Yeah. Um, and that's just a horrible place to be if you ask me. That is not where we want people posturally. I get that it does stretch a little bit, but I find that uh, that's kind of not the cue that I like to use. I find that getting the thumbs at the back of the occiput Right. And asking them right, to just there. lift there and at the same time, drop the scapula down. So back of the neck, stretch scapula, drop. And then we get this beautiful head posture without a, without a triple chin. Yeah. So we've created that lovely length. So I, I find that is a really hard, right? you can see if I go and then my shoulders actually drop. Yeah. It's just a lovely place to be. So I use this supine is the easiest. And I cue that a lot. To imagine that I'm grabbing the back of your head and just giving you some length while you are going. And I use it a lot in the, if I was supine, in the bridging. So I, I now do a lot of bridge roll up and I have them hold that and find length that way. And at the same time, find I'm length out the back of the neck that way so that the, that Im image or even having them put their hands there and find that length while they stretch the knees in the opposite direction that's sort of it i think that one of the easier places to get that length and feel it and then they can roll down and keep that length as they roll down letting the pelvis and then at the end the pelvis actually stretches the back of the neck if they can maintain that position right so coming up stretching long, stretching headlong, keeping the head long, and then taking the roll down to take the pelvis and the thighs and the rest of the body away from the head really creates that nice length and space. And then once they have, an, once they have that idea or that feeling, then trying to recreate it on all fours. Don't look at my elbows, okay, on all fours as they push away here and create that same length out the back of the neck. This one I find is more challenging. Maybe you guys have some great input here, but the head often ends up here. Up, so, yeah. And, yeah. and I try and cue, put your back of your head on the ceiling, try and get the back of the head towards the ceiling, or imagine that you've got a string pulling the head that way. And then where I feel it the most is if I take one foot out, reach that heel and then reach the head. Then I really, I really feel it here. And I tell them to focus their eyes between their thumbs on the floor and keep the eye focus there. And then this then can translate into you know, my planks or 
my whatever I want to do here once I have that. But it's this getting them from supine to find this length mm-hmm. on all fours without losing the head or pushing the back up instead of the head up. So, but that for me, that's usually the progression is supine, vertical, quadruped, plank, and then hopefully at their desk. <laughs> that's where we're going with this one. So I've but done, I don't know I've if you... Go ahead. I've tried to put the block on my head, thinking something to feed back and feel. I know the roll I've done with the long roller, but I haven't got rollers when I'm teaching on Zoom. So I was just trying to think with the block. Um, when you four point kneeling, oops, I can't, I can't see any. Oh yeah. Can you get the, Can you get the same sort of feeling from yeah. there? Yeah. Oops. Uh, oh, to maybe phone. keep it up there. I've got my hair. My phone's going to die in a minute. Yeah. Yes. Yep, that works. Because if I and then drop, got, I and lose it. That's a good one. Feedback. Thank you. Yeah, it's a nice one, isn't it? <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, the way I'm cueing it, it's to ask people to feel I'm holding the ponytail. The ponytail. <laughs> yes. And usually, suddenly, uh, very gently you feel them lengthening say imagine someone because when you say someone is pulling you from the top of the head it doesn't it address uh, Back, really yeah. uh, but the ponytail suddenly they lengthen the, the head the lengthen uh, personally I find it's working better than the the yeah. on the top of the head the back they don't know where the crown of the head is so if you say yeah. reach the crown of your head they think it's here and they yeah. put the head back so you have to say no it's here where my where my bun is that's the bit that's reaching away another one I used a not very nice one is a fish hook on a fishing oh. line into the back of their neck and lifting <laughs> yeah. that up towards the ceiling when they're on four point kneel or plank. Yes. Of having yeah. a hook there and lifting it up. But you know, if you if you can get them to stand up tall in the first place, then things are more likely to fall into place. If the, you know, but where do you start from the bottom upwards or the top downwards? Then it depends <laughs> which position you're in. <laughs> but I like that one with the block on the back of the head. I will be doing that one next week, definitely. <laughs> okay, doing the block on the head. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they mustn't knock themselves out. Um, I did it um, from last week, Zena, when we were talking, and I did my class really focused on creating space. I thought, right, yes, going to go right back. You forget some of these things, don't you? You, you go into your same routine a little bit, and it was really great. And I always remember in one of the conferences when they told us about the ladies wearing, carrying, carrying the water on their head. And they then had us putting something on our backs or hugging something and seeing how short our stride is when we're walking. And then with the block on the head, how long we can walk on our stride, creating space. And then the whole class started that way with keeping that space and keeping the block on the head and then doing all your ankle work. Um, I just hope then they remember it and maintain it as soon as they go out of class, you know, right? you gotta walk around with your book on your head. Because as soon as you sit down, your chin comes out. And yeah. um, so so it, it was hard work. So thank you for that. That was, it was a nice little bit in class to really get them to create the space. and like we said start I started with the head and the neck and then worked down through the spine creating the space and then through the hips and all the way down through the class and had that focus yeah I think um, another thing that really helps um is that idea of breathing the shoulder blades down or the scapula down the spine so I think something that goes wrong in all of it a lot of times trying to find that length, we end up and trying to get the shoulders away. Push we them end too up, far down. We'll exactly. Push, and yeah, I've, yeah. Clamp. Exactly. Just like they end rigid. up mm. clenched downward. Mm. So I was just refreshed actually this last week in a class on, you know, if you just let the arms 
hang, take a breath in and breathe the shoulder blades down the back rather than pull, pull them down or do anything. If you breathe the shoulder blades down or allow them to just slide and then Light. stretch, then you can get that space from the shoulder blades to the neck without this tension down. And then the, the neck does the wrong thing when I pull down and strap down rather than that length and being able to find length in that both direction. One, uh, you know, the, the softball, I mean, my softballs are a little bit smaller than yours, a little bit squishier, mm. but um, supine ball behind the head and pushing Central. backwards Back. into the ball. So that's lengthening out and getting some strength in the neck at the same time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're going to be doing your, your, your regular head nods with the ball there, mm -hmm. regular, you know, turning, you know, circles with the nose on the ceiling, but a few of them just pushing back into the ball. And that mm -hmm. gives them some sort of idea about that it's that sort of movement, not that sort of movement, because they will drag. Because in the old days, it, the cue was to drag the chin down. I mean, before I started teaching Pilates, but it was absolutely drawing it down. 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 Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, it's worth trying everything. Some things are going to work for some people. Some people, yes. And some, and cues some things are going to work for other people. Mm -hmm. yeah, but it's really good to have lots of different things to try. Yes. Yes, I agree. Great. Well, this hour went by super fast. <laughs> so I want to thank you guys all for being here. And I hope, you know, that you can come back. And if you have questions or thoughts or things that you want to talk about topics, if you just want to email me, um, that would be fantastic. You can email through our Facebook page. You can email directly. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it.